kind of no related to the if you're talking about getting a new body <laughs> necropants are kind of related to the movie we're doing today on the spectator film podcast oh god that's how we're going in hi everybody i'm max and i'm austin and today we're both wearing necro pants for i good want luck. nothing to do with this weird fucking intro you <laughs> <laughs> wrought upon us listen we've just been talking about necro pants for a solid 10 minutes and if you don't know what that is you really owe it to yourself don't, to just do a quick google search please don't you want, it's not really that disgusting it, it kind of is it never happened that's my only solace in this but but it's really cool it's not. Don't do it, <laughs> listeners. Don't listen to Austin but anyway, for anything. Today's movie is Seconds, directed by John Frankenheimer, 1966. Oh, this is my choice. We're jumping right to the sequel. Why aren't we doing firsts? Uh, I had to make that joke right away so I wouldn't... Just, so no one else could? Yeah. I guess he took the bullet for everybody. Yeah. You're kind of like Jesus in a lot of ways. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have uh, 12 friends that... <laughs> Would follow me around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's a good way to measure success in your life. Do you have 12 <laughs> disciples that would lay down everything for you? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I don't think uh, we have 12 listeners that would <laughs> lay down anything for us. <laughs> Enough. Stop insulting our podcast, Max. That's your job. But yeah, um, we're doing seconds. This is your choice. Why don't you explain yourself, Austin? Well, I don't really know. I just sort of been feeling an itch to do this movie. I think it's an interesting movie. I kind of have been wanting to branch out and do different types of movies and different genres. And we've done things that have been sort of like thriller based movies before, but they've been, I think mostly stuff like Hitchcock movies or Fritz Lang, um, which is a little bit more mannered, a little bit more old Hollywood compared to this, especially Hitchcock is more its own thing than just a thriller. But this movie was part of uh, what people usually call John Frankenheimer's paranoia trilogy which runs from Manchurian Candidate in 1962, then to Seven Days in May in 1964, and then finally Seconds in 1966. And I think this movie, of all of them, is the most um, sort of progressive in its uh, aesthetics. It's definitely very new wave, French new wave influenced. And it, I think it, it's quite a departure from the other two in terms of how it is actually getting at that sense of paranoia. And I feel like that's something we haven't really dived into as much on this show yet. Um, just because we haven't had as many opportunities to do movies like that yet, but this is definitely a cool movie. We've to do. definitely talked about paranoia in reference to horror films, I would say, right. but that's more of an aspect of what makes that movie scary rather than basing the entire film around it, yeah. which is a completely different process. And I, you know, cause this, what this wouldn't be, this could not be called a horror movie, but well, I think people might be tempted to, cross that line and if you're going to make a list of movies that have a horrific affective quality on the viewer i think this is up there with certain horror movies well, it makes I, you feel i hate like the, stressed yeah i hate the term psychological thriller because that's it's, a term used by the academy when they want to nominate a horror movie well this is the real thing of genre that we've yeah. talked about and i think w we agree about this where i and also i don't know really if many other people hold this opinion about genre but we think mostly that a thing's genre sort of comes down to its marketing, and then that depends on what it actually is, is how much it depart, departs from its marketing. Right? Um, that might be your opinion. My whole thing on genre is, while it can be a useful general signifier for what it is, genre a lot of the times is assigned afterward, and right. it can even override the director's wish for what the movie should be considered. Or beforehand, during yeah. production, they're like, no, this movie is supposed to be this genre. You can't do this or that. Although I sort of, I, I think you're saying a different part of what I'm saying, where if you're talking about how it overrides creative decisions, we're still thinking about how it appears on a shelf. Yeah. What category does it fit under? And I think I consider that to be part of the marketing. Basically, the term I would use is, I would use... Uh, Genre is paratextual, which means it's kind of connected to the text, but it isn't the actual movie. You know, it's your expectations of the movie when you're going into it that is set up by things like a poster or a, a uh, sort of a tagline or a commercial for the movie. But it's not the movie itself. I don't know. At any rate, this is definitely something that sits on the borderline because I think we can agree when we say it's very strong 
sort of <laughs> affect of property, you feel kind of miserable watching it. You yeah, feel no. Gross. I, it, there are movies that make me feel gross, like not to bring up John Waters yet again, because, <laughs> but uh, like, well, why not? John Waters movies make me feel gross, but they make me feel gross in an entertained and fun way. <laughs> like they're supposed to. Like, I have to be honest. His movies just don't even make me feel gross. I have, I feel like when I watch his movies, I feel like a sense of love yeah. for his characters that I just don't see in anything well, else. I feel like a sense of love for the filth that everybody is sort of rolling around in. Um, but it just makes me feel so like, no, it makes you feel, feel good. so wholesome for some reason. <laughs> It's so weird. It's, it's like, like John Waters is the most wholesome filmmaker ever. It's a fairy tale in filth. Um, but you know, this movie just like for a good chunks of it makes you feel gross and it yeah, just bleh, it really and sweaty and it really gets to you. Um, a lot of which has to do with the camera work, which I'm sure we'll get to. Yeah, it it's shot by James Wong Howe. Very impressive. And there's some fun facts about who else was on the camera crew that we'll get into. Ooh. But at any rate, this is just a movie that it's sort of been on my mind, given its content content, and just, you know, living in our capitalist wasteland. Uh, you capitalist know. Capitalist wasteland. What was that? Is that a song? Yeah, it's the, my cover of Teenage Wasteland. Oh. Check out my SoundCloud. Do you want to do Quadrophenia? No. This would be. This is the second week in a row we brought up Quadrophenia. You've brought up Quadrophenia. It's got. Uh, <laughs> oh my God! What's his face from Sexy Beast? Um, oh yeah, on Bikini. What's that guy's name? Sweltering. Um, he James Earl Jones. No, he was Beowulf. He was Cartoon Beowulf. Chris, what is his name? Chris Hemsworth. Oh God, I'm gonna kill myself. Jason Momoa. No, it's neither of these people. Dave Bautista. His name is Roy. Um, Roy Moore. Oh. <laughs> the last thing I want is to see him playing Beowulf or in a movie <laughs> called Sexy Beast. Jesus I would, Christ! I would like to see him play Beowulf if, like, he was just so oblivious that they're just like, "Yeah, we're casting you as this alpha." Oh, God, I don't want to see him in anything. I don't see him do. I don't. I don't want to see him get paid for it. I just want to like see his self delusion is like it get crumbled around him and then throw him in prison for the rest of his life. Well, anyway, well, that started off (laughs) one way and took a drastically different turn. Kind of like this movie does. Oh, but yes. So, um, so I've seen this movie a few times. I, I watched it about five years ago for the first time. It was one of the first criterion movies I ever purchased, I think. And I just, I've been a big fan of it since then. It's great. It doesn't have subtitles. Well, I didn't check. It does. Probably will not, but we should check to make sure before we slander Criterion again for this. Hashtag Criterion hates the hearing impaired. There you go. Um, what's your experience with this movie, Max? I saw The Manchurian Candidate uh, in film school because that's that's a pretty well-loved and well-regarded film. The and 60s one specifically? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I haven't seen any of this director's other films, and I watched it for the first time yesterday. Really? Yes. It's he has a really interesting ca- career trajectory where he became a real like workman in the later half of his career. Then I, think, I then I might have, but I'm not yeah. familiar with his works. Um, I much. don't know if you saw the really like clusterfuck version of The Island of Dr. Moreau with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. I never made it all the way through that. That was Dulles. his. Oh my god. Well, he was called in to film it after they fired the other guy, oh, Richard okay. Stanley, the guy who made Hardware, which is kind of kind of a neat movie and then the dust devil which is also kind of neat but not like neither of those movies really kind of neat yeah <laughs> the most glowing recommendation uh i would have to rewatch those movies but they're australian so that they, they've got that going for them but uh richard stanley that then they made that documentary about it lost soul i think about yeah. his movie at any rate John Frankenheimer became a real workman towards the second half of his career. Then I think most notably he made a movie called Ronin with Robert De Niro, which is actually pretty exciting. I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Yeah, okay. That would probably be the most likely thing if you were to watch it on TNT. I imagine that movie would show up. It's like a dad movie on a Sunday afternoon, you know, but it's kind of good. So at any rate, um, what did you think of this movie? What was your uh, rapid response? I thought it was really good. Uh, I kind of... I've said this before and I don't want to sound repeating myself, but maybe it's just the kinds of movies you end up showing me that I haven't seen before. Um, where it kind of came off as a very long episode of the twilight zone for a bit. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's going to, cause the twilight zone, all the best episodes are playing on yeah, fear of something that we know exists, but 
is slightly different than what we would expect it to be or something that we can't control. Yeah. This movie consistently plays with those themes. There's a great commentary on capitalistic death of oneself and one's purpose and whether or not you ever had your own independent dreams or those just all been co-opted by the system that you yeah. live in. I thought the acting was great. Uh, I wouldn't say besides our second half lead. No Rock pun, Hudson? Yeah, no pun intended. Uh, our second lead. Oh. There's... That's the second time you've made that joke. And it won't be the last, but... <laughs> I think he had a very strong performance. I think some of the other performances, a lot of them, a lot of the side characters are just sort of real people because a lot of this you told me was filmed guerrilla style. But um, yeah, I mean, well, side characters. This movie has a like, lot. Of, not not like, like the character actors, but this yeah. movie is shot guerrilla style. It has that verite feel to it. Um, so you, it does feel like you know when you're in Grand Central at the beginning, you literally are just in Grand Central at the beginning. And it's like you feel that reality seeping through. Oh, yeah. It's not as good as like a, in my opinion, as like a basket case. Which <laughs> has some of my, no, that has some great guerrilla filmmaking in it. That does. Where they're just like driving next to him while he's walking down the street. But or, they're carrying on the tradition. Yeah. This movie, you know, it puts some stuff out there and basket case takes the, takes the baton and runs out of the stadium somewhere else with it. <laughs> oh, basket case. Frank Henenlotter. Who is just We need insane. to redo those movies. We were just miserable when we analyzed It was it. fucking hot when we yeah. did those. Um, it was the middle of the summer. We were in a hot basement with no air conditioning, and we watched them back to back. That was in the middle of, of the whole moving period. We were yeah. s- I, we were sitting on, like, what, like, a s- stools or whatever uh, on our ass for, like, five hours in a hot basement <laughs> with no AC. Really, we shouldn't complain. I, I just think right now... Could you do you remember like the behind the scenes stories of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where the people are like this is worse than Vietnam yeah. and they're like they're they're shooting with the hot lights on like the disgusting meal they've prepared and everybody has to go out and vomit every five minutes, <laughs> which apparently happened a lot in the production of this movie. Too. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that, but uh, yay or nay on this movie? What's ultimately? Uh, I, I think I've made it abundantly clear. Yay! Um, I'm probably not going to watch this. It's one of those movies that. I'm glad I saw I appreciate and is cool and I can take lessons from it, but it's not going to be one of those movies that I'm just like, I got two free hours. (laughs) Time to watch (laughs) seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I can feel that. It's definitely a bit of a bruiser to watch, but aesthetically it's, it's amazing. So are you ready to begin the transformation? I'm ready to go. If you are Mr. Wilson. Whoa. All right. Let's go. sir. All right, everybody, we are watching the Criterion version of this disc, so you you should be seeing the blurb right now. And we can confirm once again, no subtitles. Hashtag Criterion hates the hearing impaired. Also, before we get started, I need to correct myself for any of you who are uh, going crazy over my uh, sexy beast comments. Nobody They star Ray Winstone. You haven't seen that movie. You don't know what you're missing. I know, but nobody's being like, I'm actually Austin. Actually, I don't know our audience. Maybe you guys are like that. I hope you're not. I assume you're all very attractive, nice people. As we discussed, most of them are aliens. Yeah. So it, you really can't make many assumptions about I them I assume at all. most of you are attractive, nice humanoids um, or gaseous vapors or whatever kind of aliens you are, unlike the weird fucking images we're seeing on screen right now. Well, it's interesting. We're talking about this movie in the intro as something that really helps invent a new aesthetic for paranoia. And I think this this movie comes comes out right in line with... Uh, another movie, Repulsion, directed by Rom- Roman Polanski, starring Catherine Deneuve, which came out a year prior than this, although I don't know wh- when it came out in the U.S. or what type of release it had there. Um, but it was released in 1965, and the opening sequence of this movie is, for me, very reminiscent of Repulsion, where you have just the close-ups of the eyes and everything. Of course, here it's a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit more focused on like the fluidity of body parts, than Repulsion, which yeah. is mostly just a huge close-up of an eye with which the credits is, scrolling over it. Yeah, but this is like, that's something you take away after you watch the movie, because like, yeah. when you're just thrown into this, you're just like, what is going on? At any rate, it's a very sort of graphic and startling way to begin your movie, especially in, in a sort of post-old Hollywood 
era. This is, I mean, this is the time really where the studios were starting to fall apart. Yeah. And, and they had to rely on more dramatic filmmaking techniques to try to get an audience. This movie was not a big success, but it reflects a sort of change in Hollywood film culture at the time where... I mean, you know, it does still have echoes of old Hollywood feel. I mean, it's got it. Rock Hudson in it. Yeah. But it just shows you how much was changing over such a short period of time that Rock Hudson was in this movie compared to the Doris Day romance movies he was doing in the 50s. Oh, this is a wonderful romance. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's you can just really feel heartwarming. Love just permeating throughout all of this film. But I, I will say that this is probably one of my favorite title sequences off the top of my head, just because it is so striking. They shot this with a mirror and then a, I believe, a 9.7 millimeter lens, which they bring back multiple times throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah. But it does just look, it's just really well done. And I imagine that, you know, when you're clever enough to come up with something that looks this striking and you can do it in the camera, because they're just like twisting it out of focus or, or yeah, moving the mirror or but whatever. This isn't like nowadays you could just like do this with a plug in and After yeah. Effects and it would look like shit. But the way it's done here is great. And I just love that they have that little, I don't know if you can see it in other versions, but they have a little line of spit in that person's mouth that looks so disgusting. It's fantastic. <sighs> Sorry, I had flashback to... Are you traumatized by just the commute to, no. to New York? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get a yeah, banging on Metro North in a bit, but <laughs> we were wondering if this was before or during the time where Metro North has a derailing every other week. We, well, I don't know. Metro I, North, for those who don't know, is the only train you can take from Connecticut into New York uh, City. And it is a shit show. It is well, the absolute it, worst. It really makes you... Every time I get on it, I just, I just feel like I'm taking my life in my hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was... Because I... For the longest time, I was in the impression that like most trains were like that. I went to Boston recently. Not even like, are their subways better than New York subways? Their commuter trains are absolutely amazing and well, comfortable. That's not a fucking surprise at this point. Yeah. New York has gotta gotta rise up. I think we identify with New York just because we're so close. But like seriously, the shit that's going on with the infrastructure in New York is yeah. disgraceful. Um like I didn't trust the subways in Boston because they didn't smell like piss everywhere. I'm like, this doesn't seem right. I, I can't be in the right station. Well, at any rate. We're talking over some really fantastic guerrilla style photography. And this was shot guerrilla style. This particular shot, too, that we've seen repeated, they put a little camera on top of a little, like, uh, suitcase trolley, and they were just wheeling it along. Um, the way, the reason this looks so good, and the reason why this looks kind of effortless, is because you need a genius. And I will use the word genius, which I usually am hesitant to do. You need a genius like James Wong Howe. That guy was fucking incredible as a cinematographer. One of the best ever, without a doubt. And that's definitely why they were able to pull off making this movie and uh, have it be as effective as it is. He definitely plays a huge role in inventing the aesthetic, and it begins in this first scene. Um, all the handheld stuff what works perfectly. I mean, just look at that. That's yeah. so beautiful, the way he controls the focus. Oh, it's perfect. But a fun fact about that opening scene. Okay. One thing that Frankenheimer did to try to distract people from looking at the camera was he set up the writer, I believe, and then two models doing like a romantic love scene at the oh, other yeah. end, <laughs> at the other end of the uh, uh, the Grand Lobby in, in um, Grand Central. And everybody was distracted looking at that. And apparently, if you look real closely, you can see certain people looking off in that direction throughout most of the movie. We also talked over what I, I'm not sure if it's the very first, but in my mind, it's the first uh, that I can remember, use of that weird type of body rig where they attach the camera to a person's body and it moves with them. Yeah. Which became, I feel like this is something that becomes used a lot more in music videos really than movies, but it is an interesting sort music of aesthetic innovation. Kind of, I was thinking how music videos are kind of a dying art. Like they, they do exist now, but not nearly to the degree that they used to. Well, have they transitioned to trying to do the visual album thing or is that not as big no, either? Well, that's like if you already have like a bajillion If you're big, dollars, yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing. Only like really big artists make music videos now for the most part. It's a shame. Which is weird because we live in such a visual time with YouTube and whatever. But And then we get the reveal of the note he said that he's freaking out about just as 34 Lafayette Street. And it's interesting. This movie is like, in some ways, it's a exercise in style and genre. Because at least for a decent, I'm going to say first 15 minutes of the movie, nothing really happens too much plot wise. But it's just a series of like, 
paranoia moments. Somebody you don't know comes up to you and hands you a letter that you don't know what it means. Yeah. That's kind of like a weird paranoia sketch idea. And then they just stitch these things together until you run into a plot. But the way it's shot is so effective that you're always engaged. And uh, this is also really impressive as well. I was really impressed by the editing of this, even though it might seem a little bit obvious when it's just editing back and forth and they're crossing the 180 degree line. Sorry, just one thing. He, oh, yeah? He, this is the first stop and it's Scarsdale. That is, that is. We don't know if it's the first stop, to be fair. I, I, I'm maintaining it is. That's, that's well, incredibly I'm, inaccurate. I'm just saying that when you the express train does not stop immediately in Scarsdale. When you have that paranoid editing. Yeah, I know. I'm being, let me be snarky, Austin. Okay, fine. I'm just saying. Technically, you're right. If they, this is like a commute train, this would be more, making more local stops. Because people got to get off the train. Yeah, they didn't even stop at Harlem 125th Street. Like, you, you got to go there. But at any rate, they shot that actually all on, this is the Scarsdale station, not too far from where we are. Um, and then they, they shot all of this on, on the Metro North, I believe. And uh, I think they shot most of this first part of the movie in Scarsdale, too. I'm not sure if their house is in Scarsdale, but definitely all this stuff. I mean, it looks like Connecticut. It really does. Um, and this just shows you the commitment to that, like, cinema verite style that you're really going to feel. This is, movie definitely is borrowing a lot more from the French New Wave than a lot of other stuff. And I think that's part of what differentiates it from Frankenheimer's uh, other movies in the uh, so-called Paranoia trilogy. Yeah. Because even those two movies, while I think they're effective in creating that sense of tension, they don't have the affective property. You don't feel it in your gut the same way that this well, you do it, with this movie. This gets visceral. And yeah. Like, you feel this like just... Because we don't know what he's worried about, but we know he has bigger things on his mind than this inane talk he's having with his wife. Yeah. And, like, she looks almost, she looks like very like pristine and like almost artificial but boring. And he's like a sweaty, just sort of bleh mess. Like, yeah. She looks more like what you would expect. Yeah. From a, just a marriage at this point in somebody's life. Whereas he is, you know, he's, he's kind of grouchy. He yells at her in the car. Yeah. We clearly get the idea that his paranoia and a sense is sort of wrapped up with a sense of general unease in his life. And I think you re need really good actors to do that too. These were not big time actors, but they deliver, I think, big time performances. Uh, in fact, a lot of these actors were blacklisted. Really? And, and, yeah, and John Frankenheimer um, sought a lot of them out. We'll see a number of them. I'll, I'll see if I can point out which ones, if I remember which ones they are. But yeah, this, this movie, I think, really works because of its cinema verite uh, style. And uh, it definitely does not feel like the same sort of studio movie that the other two are in this, in this oh, trilogy. No. Like compared to the Manchurian candidate, like that movie's weird and anxious, but like this feels like an entirely different beast. Um, I'm going to be honest when I was watching this yesterday for the first time, I was almost, I thought it was going to go down because it does remind me of a little twilight zone, but it kind of, I thought it was going to be like he murdered this guy. And okay. that's why he's so in denial that like he can't be alive. And now he's like calling from beyond the grave and the guy needs him because like I had this whole other plot worked out in my brain. <laughs> okay. Like when the, he goes into the office from the beginning, he's like, oh, we're working on your death. And like, oh, he's like already in purgatory. And that's what this like office cubicle area that you can't escape from. Oh, he's is. been dead the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I never assumed that of movies because that's the last thing I want it to be. Yeah. No. <laughs> But no, I wasn't I, sure. I was I, just you're like, not entirely wrong. I mean, a lot of what people pick up on on the subtext of this, and I don't mean in a narrative way, but in a more thematic way, is they talk about certain touches of like homoerotic subtext. Oh, yes. The idea of this call he's hiding from his wife with a man from his past who is gone. Right. And how they used to play tennis together. And then this is just in the 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 inscription on the bottle of the trophy uh, Fidelis Eternus, you know, yeah. which I don't think is like correct Latin, but I think it means eternal faith, something Probably. like that. Yeah. Oh, fun fact, by the way, that trophy and, uh, I believe that picture, the tall guy in that picture is actually John Frankenheimer. And once again, you know, much like, uh, some of our other movies, we know the strange connections in the things we choose. This is what our fourth, fifth movie about people, it, who play tennis being in trouble. 
I don't know what it is. Yeah, no. I think they're all my picks. I don't understand. Yeah, you 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 like people in black and white playing tennis with homoerotic subtext. You have a very or I or I just like seeing people who play tennis or used to play tennis in bad situations. Yeah. With homoerotic subtext, though. That's very important. And you're right. It's a very loose translation for Latin for eternal faith. Yeah. Uh, so it is interesting. Yeah. You get that. And I think it's going to be, you know, sort of carried home here. He's obviously not satisfied in his marriage. And it comes at the expense of his wife. You know, he obviously is not capable of treating her as the person <laughs> That he respects, yeah, somebody that, to the point that you would marry them. As right? you pointed out yesterday, we have like almost Hayes Code era, like they're sleeping in separate. Yeah, beds. I think first of all, this scene is beautiful the yeah. way this is lit, but it almost it's such a weird contrast just in the scene on a micro level because you introduce it with these two beds, like it's a Hayes Code thing, and then you're gonna get this wide shot, which is kind of like a studio era shot, maybe more so than the rest in this movie. Then we're suddenly gonna cut very quickly here to the same sort of verite style right here that we saw earlier. And suddenly it's almost like it's paying off something that you didn't know it was setting up because uh, the style works, but this is, this is exactly the style that would, you would use to try to have like an intimate moment. You yeah. Know? But also it's just, it's gross. <laughs> well, that's the reason is because, because this is what you would do to really try to convey the emotional tenor of this moment they're having when he rejects her, it feels so much more painful and miserable. Yeah. Because it tries to go for the intimacy and it fails. And because it genuinely goes there with the camera and it gives the, the actors the close up, you know, it really lets you feel like the hidden pain of what's going on in the scene. Uh, and yeah, this movie is kind of emotionally brutal. No, there's no high points. There's no just like, oh, everything's going to end up fine it's and just, i think everything is terrible and sad and it's going to stay that way and there's nothing you can do about it it's interesting how even in the later parts of the movie when supposedly when he's rock hudson i yes. mean who wouldn't want to be rock hudson right maybe what, rock hudson we don't know <laughs> oh that's profound yeah. max but even when he's rock hudson and everything seems to be going okay there's never a point where you feel like it's actually going okay you know and I'm just so impressed by their camera placement. I know I brought this up to you during the preview screening, but I think it's amazing that even in just this one shot as he's sitting at his banking job, they're able to communicate a sense of paranoia just with this close-up and how they position it. Like the, 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 the lens they're using, I believe the other one they used was an 18 millimeter for most of the movie. And then the 9.7 when they really wanted to use the wide angle effect. But here they use the wide angle effect to really make his head appear bigger and really put the other stuff uh, further in the background at a lot of depth. Um, yeah. And then they sort of, I, I guess they opened it up a little bit. So they have the shower focus. Um, and I think it just, I, something about it is so perfect with the actor's performance it just works to communicate a sense of unease and tension well and it also like just in that scene alone we show that like his job isn't like even really necessary like the secretary yeah <laughs> like he can just say etc cetera, etc cetera, standard ending like and that's going to be an interesting thing that we're going to talk about too later how both halves of this movie are really representations of the same thing just in different ways yeah it is interesting you point that out because i didn't think about that but he is kind of superfluous at his own job anyway. Yeah. And it's interesting. Well, like even, even though he got like, he got the front page of the paper when he died, apparently. I guess so. But God, this scene is beautiful too. I know a guy who like comes into my work all the time who looks exactly like that. And it's like the old man. Yeah. It's terrifying. Oh, like, he's got a great old man face. Yeah. I'm like, cause that's definitely, maybe it was his grandfather, <laughs> but or just his father that looks exactly like him. It's a shame that really old people don't get as many opportunities to lead movies because I, I hope this doesn't sound like patronizing or shitty, but the way people age, some people just have so much character in their face. Yeah. You know, and it, you could put them in a movie and I feel like if they were any sort of good actor at all, they would really, they could really like, God, they could really just crank out performances. Well, I think even I, just as extras, you know, this guy's just a glorified extra. Yeah. But something about the steam and the way they shoot it is just 
Excellent. Now, here's the other interesting thing about that. We're cutting. He's going to see the secret company at the address that he we, received. We don't even know that, person. though. We just know he's going to the address because his old uh, long lost friend has right. told him to. We don't know it's a company yet. We don't know anything about it. We know is... he's not satisfied with his life, and this is something that he's just doing because he's interested. Yeah. Uh, but we, the first two places we see, right? What do we see? Laundromat and then Meatpacking Company. Foreshadowing. Those yeah. things are not unconnected. Uh, and fun fact, this was, I think this was shot in our, uh, California. But the guy who is leading him is Honest Arnie. And I just think it's hilarious. We're going to see in a bit that this place is called Honest Arnie's Used Cow Dealer. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? The used cow dealer. Yeah, you could see it on his jumpsuit. What the fuck does that mean? What is a used cow? Well, it's not a new cow. They've already milked it and grown up and now it's just dead. But it is kind of a nice metaphor for just like repurp- yeah, repurposing meat. Yeah. It's just so perfect that that was actually what it was named in real life. <laughs> It's like, what the fuck? It works so perfectly with the movie. It's insane. Yeah. Definitely like some, maybe the script supervisor saw that and they're like, John, I found a place. You won't eat meat for months after walking into there and filming, which is true, by the way. Yeah. A lot of the crew were traumatized by having to go in there. They were like throwing up, you were saying, but. It was not the last time that happened, but no. uh, definitely they seem to be traumatized by having to go. Honestly, that meatpacking meat packing thing just reminded me of the opening of Blade where they were like going through the. The, yeah. the rave? Yeah, the rave, because it's like through a meatpacking warehouse. And oh, place. okay. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, Blade was obviously influenced by this movie greatly. Max is going to do a video essay on meatpacking industries and film yeah. and their depictions. Sure, check out my YouTube channel uh, at Red Litter Media. I've done a lot of good work. <laughs> Need to both just get that out of the way so we can put the dollar in the jar for this episode. Yeah, why not? But here's something else that you pointed out the other day. Um, when we were watching it for the preview screening, is that it's interesting that they put him in the jumpsuit over his clothes. Yeah. You you would say that it's, it, it is totally, it winds up being totally superfluous, right? You could say it's being sort of secretive, but he just has his other hat open, right? So it becomes this interesting detail when he arrives at this facility that he arrives there in blue collar clothing compared to his more like white collar job as, I assume the manager of this bank. Yeah. Or he's close to being the the vice president. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's going to say something about his status as a customer when he comes into this area. Uh, we'll talk about it more during the, Oh, we get this neat Picasso painting, by the way, we'll talk about it more, um, during the, you have rebirth. Nice little, with what? No, well, just the painting. You have birth. And the whole place is like a rebirth facility. It is interesting. I was thinking about this, just the way gender plays in this. I think a lot of his paranoia trilogy is about weak men or men whose masculinity is not fitting with traditional notions. And because yeah. of that, because of that, they're beat up on and they become weak, right? And people tell them they're weak. So then they just start be- to behave that way. And it's interesting because the movie doesn't actually fall into the the trap necessarily of endorsing their weak masculinity fully, but it's sort of, it's sort of, um, I don't know, looking at it like a doctor and saying, why are these people sort of connected to the destruction of this system? That's the thing that makes it more objective when they look at the weak masculinity is they somehow all these movies connect that to an idea of like your specifically Manchurian candidate in this one, it connects it to the system and how the system manipulates people through masculinity also, okay, but we're going to get this scene, but we're going to get some nice German expressionist touches. Yeah. yeah. Um, they really go big in this sequence. I think it pays off. I think it does. It's not obnoxious. We're like, there are some movies that like, we get it. You've seen the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. That's very nice of you. Can you make your own movie now? Well, again, but, I think it's because they commit earlier. Yeah. It doesn't feel as crazy. And because because this is only this was the nine point seven millimeter, obviously, and, and this it, is awesome. It's done in such a fun way. Yeah. yeah. To to anybody who doesn't know, they they built a specific set to give get that optical effect, and then they sort of doubled it by using the nine point seven millimeter lens to make it just re- look really crazy. And I think I could speak for both of us when I say that that type of in camera special effects is something that we fucking love. Oh, of course, like. 
here's the thing. Because I would call that a special effect. Yeah, we okay, we bash on CGI and plugin effects and whatnot. And listen, I know a lot of people work very hard on CGI effects. I know that like it is it is a type of labor and it is hard, but like it's a different effect. It doesn't affect the world of the film the same way that a physical effect does, which is why I like practical effects better. And the same thing can be said for camera effects where the camera is a physical thing. And if you're filming something while changing physical things about the camera or doing causing an effect just by like light changes or how things are reflecting into it, it has a much more profound effect on what you're shooting. than it's just like, Oh, well after effects had this thing so I can do this. And And that's almost even if it's close to being indistinguishable. If you know it's digital, it's hard I think to do that. And you're right. I think you're right when you say there's something really to be said about the like material existence of, of real effects and just, and and stuff like that. Like even for your actors, like Ian McKellen famously, uh, Oh, with the fucking light he had to act against in Lord of the Rings. No. in the new, uh, Hobbit movies. Oh, he, uh, apparently broke down crying during one of the filming sets. Cause it was just him, it was supposed to be like a group scene, but it was him acting alone, just talking to a green screened wall like for hours. Don't make Ian McKellen cry. Yeah. Like, come on, Peter Jackson. Here we have Murray Hamilton, who it, to most people would be recognizable as Jaws Mayor. <laughs> Jaws Mayor. The, the character Jaws who's, Mayor. who's made the worst decision in film history. Oh, I didn't know. So is that his, is that Charlie? The one that was looking up in the back? Yep. No, that's cute. I didn't notice he was looking at him the entire time since he's been here. Yeah. He's also in, uh, more importantly than Jaws, he's in a uh, William Castle movie called 13 Frightened Girls, which I think would make for a really good Netflix show, although it's that not sound, a great movie. That also sounds like a porno title. but like it's, re- it's weird because there's really no Frightened Girls. It's about a bunch of daughters of ambassadors, and it's like they're doing political intrigue, but it's like young girls doing political intrigue against each other. It's kind of an interesting premise and you get all these girls from different countries having to interact with each other. It's kind of yeah. interesting, but it doesn't do as much with it as I'd like. I love the way that this guy just steps out of this, <laughs> of, out of the corner there. It definitely puts a bullet point on like the whole Kafka esque feeling of this, which it, this is an opportunity to use Kafka esque in the real definition of the word in yeah. the sense that it's a weird bureaucracy, not because you're turning into a bug. And, and I, like, I also love this actor's performance. I know this is the sort of the thing in the movie where it's just supposed to be like he's sort of floating along through life. But like you feel like he would have asked more questions by now. Well, here's the thing to get back to what you were talking about, where he walks in as a blue collar, dressed yeah. as a blue collar worker. And also the idea that he is walking in here as a customer. I think an interesting part of this is that he's so conditioned by the roles that this business sets up for him, that he's the customer that he would never ever expect he would be in danger or anything. Yeah. He's the customer. You know what I mean? He feels safe right now because of the situation he's in. And part of that has to do with how this character is kind of searching for a sense of agency that he can never get because he's been on an autopilot his entire life. Kind of. No, definitely. That's really the whole thing that he realizes at the end is like, everybody's been making his choices for him his entire life. Well, yeah, that's the epiphany at the end of the movie is that nothing matters. And like, even (laughs) because they decide his life as an artist, because like, apparently they questioned him while he was drugged. Yes. And they asked him what, if you could be anything, what would it be? And he said a tennis player. And they're like, no, no, (laughs) Uh, forget that. (laughs) Forget being a tennis player. But anyway, you know, I think, I think it's interesting that you brought up the blue collar worker thing because it, it introduces that idea of the difference between being a customer and kind of working for the system, you know, where this whole life he's, he's felt that he's been an individual making his own choices, but he didn't realize that his mind was being regulated by capitalism in this kind of sneaky way. This part is so fucking weird. Like (laughs) it is a really weird detail that they, they brought in the food for him to do that and uh, it's so conspicuous it reminds me a lot of uh, well, th- like it makes sense that he doesn't want to eat it because like the last thing he drank apparently drugged him so like <laughs> but this guy's just going to town i know i'm hungry actually <laughs> are you up for this chicken that they bake the cheese onto it to make it look really crispy yeah that sounds delicious well this is funny you mentioned that because uh this movie in general reminds me a lot of the 1997 david fincher movie the game 
And this scene in particular, there's another scene in that movie where Michael Douglas has to meet with like this weird hidden company that's going to do something for him. Then he's not sure what he's going to do yet because he was referred by his brother in that movie, I think. Oh, okay. And uh, James Rebhorn, the famous character actor, is the guy doing it in that. He almost looks vaguely similar to this guy, but he's also, as he's telling it to him, he's also like stuffing his face with food. It's kind of, I think it's probably an explicit reference. But I do like this guy's performance. He is so good at being like the slightly affable middleman, you know? Yeah, that's just the way he like voraciously devoured that food. Like I got the impression like they weren't feeding him or something. And he's just like, can I, can I please eat? But yeah, I, I do think that fact about the, the jumpsuit is really interesting. Because we're going to see that he doesn't really have a choice even in this moment, as no, we're going to see. No, of course not. And also, the company is kind of... This company, really, the way it's structured, works like a like a multi-level marketing scam, you know? Well, yeah, you have it's to It's kind a, of like Amway. You have to get a... Or, yeah, fucking... You have to suggest somebody else. <laughs> and that's the only way you can get what you really want. yeah. That's how you like move up. That's how you get the new surgery or whatever. If we're, we have any listeners who are involved with any multi-level marketing things, please, please stop. Just cut your losses and get out before it consumes everything. Those things are really fucking scummy. There's nothing worse than keep going. I, I know the cult mindset, a big part of it is like, when you're like $15,000 deep, you can't pull out of that investment. But there's it's, nothing worse. It's not an investment anymore. It's just a debt. It's theft. You're not going to get to double black diamond level or whatever they call it. Like, You're talking about OT, Scientology. No, there's like a bunch of multi-level marketing things that just like the more sales you make and the more people you've brought in, like the higher level. Oh, yeah. Level. I mean, there's that's it all works the same. Yeah. It's all just there's that weird overlap of the cult logic. You know, with with the weird participation and stuff like well, that. Yeah, especially since a lot of them have like over the top charismatic CEOs, which this company does as well. Yeah, and I think that's an important part of that. The, I mean, we I didn't really think about this movie in, in reference to cults and how the logic of that works specifically, but it is kind of similar, you know. And you could you could also compare it to just the way the system works in general, right? Where capitalism works by holding up models for success to people and saying, if you work hard enough, you can do this. But really what it does is capitalism is all about externalizing reality <laughs> and ex externalizing cost so that the true cost of capitalism isn't visible to customers. You know what I mean? Like what is the external? He doesn't know the cost of his cadaver. You know, he yeah. doesn't know that very well. One of the people, here's an interesting fact. When he went into that room, do you think one of the extras in that room is the cadaver that would be his cadaver that they killed? It could very well be possible. Yeah. Like, we don't find that out until the end of the movie, that a lot of the dead body thieves are people who <laughs> have flunked out of their life, their yeah. second life. That's why this script, I think, is so tight, because there's all these interesting things where it's like, they just really thought about how this customer would interact with this business and what parts are visible and what parts are not. You know, no, and it is enjoyable for a second watching to pick up on things to be just like, oh, they didn't forget about that at all. They made sure that that would be a thing but way on in the beginning. Before you they mentioned ended. charismatic leaders. Yes. Now, here we have this paternal figure who I don't even know if we ever get his name. No, but he's a wonderful southern grandpa and I love him. Oh, he's such a good performance. This actor I know was blacklisted. I think his name is William Gear. Uh, he was blacklisted and his performance here is excellent. Um, he does a great, this is not a Satan character. No, but it's, this is a great Satan archetype. The old man who's very like paternal. Yeah. Confident and just sort of warm and friendly. And I just want to help people. Specifically. It reminds me of one of my favorite cinematic Satans, which is uh, Satan from a great movie called the devil and Daniel Webster. Sorry. The cinematic Satans is my new band name. There you go. Yeah. We could do a whole month of cinematic. Oh, <gasps> We could do The Devil and Daniel Webster. That one's played by Walter Houston, which is so similar to this. I would say it's almost like it's almost like it's it's forerunner. Um, but he is a great Satan, Walter Houston. What a great actor. Um, we could do uh, we could do Bedazzled. 
That's a weird one. That's a really weird say. Ah, oh, I like that Satan. Um, we could do a bad Satan. Although I, we could, do, we could do the Devil's Carnival, the spiritual sequel to Reaper the Genetic Opera. <laughs> no. Is Satan in that? Yeah, it's called the Devil's Carnival. Well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh. Would you yeah. say that Tim Curry in Legend is Satan? They call him the Darkness. But I mean. He's definitely Satan in a fucking visual way. No, in what? What's that movie? Fucking uh, Tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny. Um, <laughs> Tim Curry isn't in that movie. I think he is. I think he plays the devil in that movie. I'm like, I'm very skeptical. Okay, but you know what? If anybody was dedicated enough to p- go through that shit twice, <laughs> it would be Tim Curry. If he is Satan, I I like that movie more. But at any rate, uh, I don't know, listeners, let us know some good, <laughs> some good recommendations for good movie Satans. That'd be great. Now, here we have this actor giving him the hard sell. And I just love this decision to hold the long take. I know I talked about the strength of the editing earlier, but I didn't really get to mention it. I think um, this movie is really interesting to look at how the editing sort of combines with the cinematography to create the old overall paranoia effect. Uh, obviously, in situations like this, it's all about knowing when not to cut and when to hold the long shot. Dude. Oh, I was completely wrong. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that guy's like 6'5 and like Jack. <laughs> you don't know who it was instead? No. It was Dave Grohl, <laughs> the drummer for Nirvana and the oh. lead singer of the Foo Fighters. Well, okay. What am I thinking of? God, okay. Oh, you know what I'm thinking of? Tim Curry played a devil-like figure in a video game that Jack Flack starred in uh, called Brutal Legend, which is a game I hold near and dear to my heart. But Okay. That's what I was thinking of. Well, at any rate, the editing of this movie is fantastic. I think this movie, the editor rides a really good line between like what you might call invisible editing and conspicuous editing to make the editing kind of jarring, but not too jarring for it to be conspicuous, just jarring enough for it to be like evocative of a type of paranoia. And again, it interacts with the way they, they really shoot for that editing style too, which is the impressive thing that takes a lot of vision by both the director and cinematographer, but they do a lot of stuff where they shoot, set up shots and um, well, usually a rule for editing to help, smooth cuts be sold. I don't know if our listeners will know this, but you're going to want to change certain things um, in your shot setups to make the cuts smooth. So usually you'll cut on an action, right? To sell the cut, somebody will move their hand or look in a different direction and they will, they will cut on that because it will sell the transition more. Or what they'll do is when they cut to a new shot, it will be from a, a, a very different angle, but not too different, not crossing the 180 degree line usually. But you're going to do it from a different angle on the scene, whether you know, you're tilting up or down on it, different height. Point is you're going to change the position of the camera to make the cut visually different as well. It makes you feel uncomfortable instinctually because like, wait, that wasn't the same way. Like- well, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm okay. saying that's usually what it's done when it's normal. Because usually when you cut in the action and you change the angle, it's like, oh, this is this is a new shot, but it flows. Whereas if you do not change the angle at all, but then you cut to it, you're like, whoa, this is just like a zoomed in version of a, the same shot. But the camera yeah. didn't move. It's weird. And this movie does that a few times in a, in a little bit of a sneaky way to keep you sort of on your toes. And uh, I think... I think the way it does the balancing act is really impressive because it's very easy for that to sort of go off the rails and just be like, I get it. You're trying to be, you know, (laughs) trying to make me feel paranoid. But what you're doing is you're just kind of giving me a headache. But this movie is never that jarring. Why do they need him to sign is the thing. Like everything they're doing, as they've said, is like super illegal. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things you can pick about this movie with that. But also... Part of it is just the coding of what a business is. Yeah. No, like, if I'm taking all of this literally, I'm just like, no, yeah, there's no way that. I mean, I think you could even retcon it to be like part of them signing is part of the security that a customer feels with signing. Yeah. 
to make they it will, seem like a legitimate business. They will become passive if they have to sign something. You know, it's weird, but you can play those games with this movie. By the way, fun fact, this was an actual facial and reconstruction also, surgery. Yeah, that they filmed. But uh, Or I don't know if it was facial reconstruction. It was definitely a, a type of plastic surgery. But <laughs> fucking... People vomited a lot, I think, during this That's sequence. also, like, you can make it so, like, the customer is like any any terrible shit you do to them any like like well you agreed to this like yeah it's your fault not ours and like they do that throughout the movie like when he has a breakdown during his second life they're just like oh i can't believe you failed living this new life that yeah. like, we forced you into and i think that's the really interesting thing compared to the other movies in this in this loose trilogy is because it's like those other two are very overtly political and this is political as well it's more under the surface but it's still political um, but those two are, are more about, you know, different outside forces hijacking our, our, uh, institutions, our political institutions in Manchurian candidate. It's somebody brainwashing the president to try to get control power from the outside. And then from, uh, seven days of May, it's a coup. It's a planned coup. And in this, it's just that, no, the world you live in is evil, you know? There, uh, there's no, just... there's no safety net for you. This is fantastic. This actor's performance is really excellent as well. Um, I can't quite remember this actor's name, but he appeared in a few Stanley Kubrick movies. Why are they like letting him feel all of this pain right now? Like, <laughs> I don't know. If he couldn't speak, I would say the first thing I would do is be like, "Listen, don't speak." Yeah. But, but I'm not a doctor, Max. I don't know. The other interesting thing that I think the plastic surgery part of this really sells is like the whole sort of new age of the world thing that might've been going on in the sixties, right? Where it's the real transition into what will come to resemble our world today in terms of how technology works in our government and our system, you know, TV is a thing now, you know, well also like it's a very human telling of the classic thing of the ship of theseus of like do you know that yeah where the boat is built out of different parts well the the progressively until there's none remaining from the original yeah so like if we like because they talk about they change everything they've changed his vocal cords they've changed his muscles yeah muscular structure in his face and in his uh, hands and whatnot it's just like and then he goes back to his old life later on in the movie and one it, it wasn't what he remembered but two it's like he can't fit in there anymore. So like, right. how much of a person can you change and have them still be the same person? Well, it's interesting that it doesn't just take that idea. It's like, it, it takes that and it does, I think more successfully than repo, the genetic opera. It turns that into a how commodity. How dare you suggest that a movie can do it. Oh, better this than... is a great shot too, yeah. by the way, just the decision to actually just mount the camera on the t- swivel chair. Even though I think you can see it a little bit. You can, I think you can see the lens slightly in the mirror, but it doesn't matter. And here we have Rock Hudson in what most people, uh, well, I don't know if most people, a lot of people will say this is his best performance. And I think he's really excellent in it. I think he does a really good job. He's not somebody that commonly I think is thought of for re- giving really deep performances. Um, but I think he was definitely a solid actor in his time. Uh, I think he was probably victimized by the fact that he was in a lot of those romance movies that people would dismiss. Um, but he was in a lot of good stuff. He's in one of my favorite movies of all time, All That Heaven Allows. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that. I have, yes. Yeah, that one is really, oh, that is such a good movie. Then we're doing time for physical therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I never agreed to this. <laughs> but yeah, I, I... This is the saddest training montage of all time. <laughs> Oh, here we have another holdover from Manchurian Candidate. Yes. Um, I believe this actor's name is Kai Day. And uh, another holdover from William Castle's 13 Frightened Girls. You really pushing that movie. It's just weird. Getting that William Castle money and promoting filmmakers without them. God, I wish. William Castle is. I just love William Castle. I believe somebody once described him as a affable polar bear. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, that seems about right. Why are you still nervous about anything? You let these people like completely change your body. Cause he is just emasculated generally, you know? And, and even here's the thing, even though he is undergoing this change, 
this still isn't what he wants, you yeah. know, and that's what he's going to realize at the end. And I think this, the reason why this scene is key is because once again, this actor is playing the, the hypnotist type of character, right? And that's where the magic happens in the system. How do we regulate somebody's mind to tell them their goals is an, that they are an individual and that their goals are different from anybody else's and that they can achieve them on their own and that the interests of the system are really their own interests is the real thing. And it is a kind of hypnotism, which is why it's interesting when you sort of compared this this sort of system that's going on in this company to types of cults going on. Because it is really something that happens where people believe it's in their best interest to do what is actually in the best interest of the group that's manipulating them. I would say the creative through line is obvious. And it's like, no, tennis and painting are very different. <laughs> yeah. It's just that. But it, it's neat, right? They drug him, they get him to say this. And we know because of what he says to to the wife later that I think there's an implication that he had dabbled slightly in painting yeah. earlier. So we know that that's a thing. But it's interesting how they, they manipulate him and commodify that into a role for him, you know? Well, here's the thing. So they say they're creating an entirely new identity for him. But all these like diplomas and whatnot and the fact that the artist already has a career and there's that one guy who greets him at the airport and is like, oh, if I wasn't going to catch a plane, I'd make you buy me a drink. I'm not sure if the movie ever explicitly explains this or not, but is there a chance that like this artist was somebody who wanted <laughs> a different life and they just sort of like co-opted him into this like I don't know was Mr. Wilson a real person like I don't know because you would have to ostensibly they would have to recreate his face yeah so I don't know if that's possible maybe I mean there's all sorts of games you can play with this because the limits of your imagination this movie does a good job at, at managing the information in such a way where you ask those questions and then the evil of this business is only the limits of your imagination, right? Because the evils of how capitalism works is only the, the limits of your we, imagination. Yeah. Cause at the end of the movie, we realize that the bodies that they use to fake their deaths are other clients. Right. So like it's if, this endless wheel. If this artist was sick and was just like, Oh, I want a different life. Yeah. I want to be a, a fucking banker. So I don't have to worry about or whatever it is money ever again. Like, yeah. right. The thing is, this is the real thing that this movie like, is the real thing about this movie and capitalism in general is that just as the evil of this business is the limits of your imagination, your ability to make money off of this or that is also dependent on the limits of your imagination. And also how evil are you willing to be to make money? Because there's technically no limit. There's nothing that's off the table. That's the problem. Well, yeah. And Not everything should be on the table to make money. And that's the real problem with capitalism is it doesn't accept that. You were telling me this scene which I have a hard time believing, but you insist is true. They shot it. They had to shoot it. <laughs> they shot this on a real airplane, everybody. Which was hard to do with the size of like portable cameras back then. Well, it was a bit smaller. But yeah. point is, it's still a pain in the ass because in order to do it properly, you have to remove the seats. Yeah. Also, you have to... Um, well, actually, they probably really had to lock down the camera. So yeah. they probably needed a decent tripod to do that. And they probably had to install something in the floor of the plane to keep it bolted down. But uh, point is, it's kind of a pain in the ass to do. Um, and I would agree with maintaining the cinema verite thing. This was James Wong Howe's decision, by the way, to shoot it in the plane. It was not his decision to use this actor who was Rock Hudson's um, wardrobe person's girlfriend. That's a yeah. weird continuity error, by the way. But apparently she kept fucking everything up. <laughs> to the point where they had to do, they, they shot this on a flight from Los Angeles to Portland. And I think they had to do it like three or four times. Just because you were so nervous about Rock Hudson? Yeah, you said it was like five times they had to fly back from like Oregon to California. Yeah, that's nuts. I mean, that's not the longest flight in the world. But it's still pretty fucking long. It's like... How many takes of it do you need? Yeah. And then John Frankenheimer on the commentary track that's on the Criterion disc is just like, oh, fuck, we only used like two shots from this. <laughs> I can only imagine, but then... Well, here's the other thing. Like, this guy could just be another guy from the company to, like, establish that, like, oh, you're a, you're a known person. Oh, this random guy? Yeah. Well, here, I'll give my theory a little bit later. What I want to go back and do is pick up that scene with Kai Day, right? I believe that's his name, um, where he says, 
the only thing you do is a responsibility to pursue your own interests. And like we're saying, that's the great lie of this company, is that his so-called own interests are actually the interests of the company, as we'll see. Yeah. And when he is... Because when he does try to follow his own interests and he starts sort of breaking cover or whatever, that is against the interests, interests of the company. And that's when the difference is revealed, right? Because you cannot have him go against the system if that those are his interests. It's okay that he has his own interests as long as they're also the interests of the company. Yes, and also you can't mention thing that might destroy the interests of the company. Because, yeah. Like, as we see him mentioning his past life, even though 50% of the people at the party, as we find out, are all seconds, he can't mention that it's it's an off-topic thing, even though it's very relevant to him. Well, I, I, I think it's it's not merely that he can't mention it to them. It's that they don't want him to, like, blow the cover. But it, it's interesting that they just, they completely, they completely remove the idea of agency so long as it's going against the group. Yeah. But that's also the selling point of this whole thing, is that you're trapped in your life and it has sacrificed your agency because you're stuck in a rut. Right? And that's the that's you're the, just a gear turning yeah. for no real purpose. You're just it's the great thing of this is that it's just selling you the same thing you already had. You know, you're already you're successful, you're wealthy, and yeah. Except now you're alone and you have no history. Yes. And that's the other interesting thing is like the weirdness of okay. I was thinking about this. Is it weird? But it, it this is not this genre of movie. But it would be interesting to compare this movie to time travel movies. Yeah, kind of. I can see where... He does a weird type of time-traveling thing physically where he time-travels in his body. He time-travels to an alternate timeline, sort of, right? Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at in that way. And I think it's like... It's also this weird thing where, again, capitalism externalizes reality a lot, right? How would you... This is a little off-topic. Okay. But for time-travel movies in general, they're very hard to make work... Just because, like, as you and Seth, like, Bill and Ted is one of the better examples because it's just, like... It embraces the silliness of it. Yeah. Yeah. But... There's just, like, you can do a lot with the concept. It's just, like, it requires a lot of thinking and covering your bases. And after a while, somebody just, like, you just kind of give up on that. And you're just, like, fuck it. Accept the science of the movie or not. Yeah. And I think part of the problem with literal time travel is because there's no way to actually square it with rational logic. You know? Yeah. Well, where God. unless it's about the fact that it's irrational, there then was, it's hard for it to work. There was somebody, I forget where online, but somebody was like having an idea for a show where like there's a time travel agency and they're like policing time or whatever, but it's not from their perspective. It's yeah, from the perspective of the costume designer that works there who has to make authentic clothing from every time period. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Or, it's like a time cop's remake time yeah. cop remake except they just have to go through and make the outfits it's forever. like what do you mean you're going to feudal japan i'm not staying up all night hand painting silk are you kidding me that's just the costume wardrobe yeah. person from hollywood basically yeah. right every time they have to make a movie set in the past yeah but you can like you can if you can fudge that it's like you can't just like make a legitimate you don't have to make a legitimate kimono yeah the but then pedantic did. people are going to ding you yeah and you're like fuck these people are going to stop the movie on this frame and point out that th that's not the right fucking coin that was used at this point in time in American history I mean like that became a hashtag with Game of Thrones when a Starbucks cop was on the they have Starbucks in that universe of course they do house, house Starbucks but yeah, I, I think it is interesting to compare this to maybe a time travel movie because it also plays on this idea of like a type of nostalgia, right? For when, you, like, when you had options ahead of you. Yeah. and Or the illusion of them. Yeah. And just this movie reveals all the selling tactics, you know, and how it's all just lies. It's all lies. By the way, we didn't mention that, but this character actor, his butler, Wesley Addy, is in a number of really good movies. Um, well, Network is one that I think of prominently. I just think he's a solid actor. And I think it's interesting how he he plays this type of, like, servile coldness you know he does try to strike up a conversation with him about the random person that approached him at the airport but except he, he gets nothing in return yeah no he's very unsettling as well like he plays like the very like I'm gonna listen to whatever you say but like I'm clearly pushing you toward what you're supposed to quote unquote being also not to be annoying and nitpicky but like just as 
somebody who enjoys art and artists. Like they set him up in the perfect position for an artist because he's already successful. He already had his thing and he already has money. Right. And they say like, oh, he's going through a transitional period right now. So just go fucking weird with it. Go Jackson Pollock. Throw paint on the thing. Go but he's not creative enough to do yeah. that. I think that's part of the point is that he doesn't actually do any of these things because he doesn't know what he wants to do, right? And they keep trying. Even art can be an industry, Yeah, you know? That's just, the thing. Just go fucking Andre Serrano. Put a crucifix inside of a jar of piss and take a picture of that and have it blow up for being controversial. Like, do whatever you want, man. Really, I think some of David Lynch's paintings would speak to this guy. Yeah. David Lynch does this interesting thing with the paint, which I think is probably a common technique overall. I'm not going to pretend to be an art expert or historian, but where he really piles on layers of yeah. paint or he'll mix it with other substances. And it's when you look at it, it's interesting because in some of his paintings, it's like this idea of like a real thing bursting through an image. Right. Well, that's like, that goes back like, uh, cause everybody and their mother has seen starry night. Like it's on puzzles. It's on mugs. It's on everything. I actually, not my to, mother. No. What? <laughs> Sorry, but I got to see that actual painting in person at the Museum of Modern Art when they cool. had it. That painting is something that like it doesn't translate to a 2D image well because of the way that he piled the paints on. Yeah. And whatnot, the swirls and whatnot add such depth to that that it looks so much more amazing in person. Yeah, I know that there's some truth to the idea of like arts. Uh, this is a critical term used by Walter Benjamin in his seminal essay, <laughs> Art in the Age of Its Reproducibility, or sometimes, it's a translation, so it's yeah. translated differently. But he uses this idea of aura. And when he wrote that essay, well, about 100 years ago now, it's been a while, um, he was talking about how like art is kind of like, he uses this word bourgeois thing, right? Yeah. And the authenticity of something can be something that's oppressive. But like, also, when you just... The disintegration of aura doesn't happen totally, you know, when you see a picture of something online. No, it doesn't completely disappear, but it is yeah. a completely different experience. When you do see it yeah. in person. I think the same thing about Mark Rothko paintings because they're so big and you just look like a... You look it up on Google and it's just like some colors. Yeah. It's just like some colors. But when you see it, it's like, whoa, it's like fills a room, you know? <laughs> but anyway. Well, what's that like... Who's that artist? Barton Newman, who like paints like gigantic, like huge canvases, like red and like a sliver of blue, and they sell for like thirty million dollars. And that's that's the thing. Where that's the, what you should do. That's like we don't need a Patreon anymore if you do that. I appreciate art criticism, like because we're doing art criticism right now. But like, there is a huge element to it where it's just like somebody can make a great painting that isn't valued because it's not being considered by art critics. Have you ever seen F for fake? No, I haven't. You should. It's all about this. It's Orson Welles before the other side of the wind. It was his last movie. It's actually pretty amazing. Um, it's all about this, the contradiction of actually putting a price tag on art. It's about a forger named Elmir, right? And he forges paintings that are you could never, you could never distinguish. In fact, a lot of people in the art market don't distinguish because it makes them more money to have another yes. Picasso, right? So they take advantage of him. Really interesting movie to anybody who hasn't seen it. But at any rate, here we're introduced to uh, Salome Jens, I think is her name. I think she gives a really good performance here. And uh, it's interesting that they meet on the beach. I'm going to talk about that. But I think to connect it back to that guy who meets him at the airport, I think... And to the David Lynch painting we were just talking about, obviously this guy, what he's looking for, in a sense, is a, an idea of reality, right? He's looking for an idea of reality, something authentic, something that's authentically him, you know, and not yeah. who he feel, feels he's been directed to be by his life. And I think part of the company's tactics that are interesting is they set up these pseudo-authentic experiences for him to try to sell the reality of what's going on beginning with that weird guy at the airport. Of course, he's just baffled because he's like, yeah. what the fuck? But the thinking is if somebody authentically reacts to you, maybe you just part as part of a reflex, you react the same way and then it becomes your authentic reality through repetition. Yeah. And then like 
we meet this woman who's just like, oh, I left my family and started new. And he's just like, oh, maybe what I'm doing isn't so weird. And I can adjust to this life now because this woman's doing it and she seems fun. Yeah. And it's like, it's the idea of like, oh, maybe what I'm doing is no less fake than what she's doing. Yeah. But also, most importantly, by the way, another interesting idea, if you want to get real film school with it, the idea that they're both introduced to wearing different colors. Oh, you'll, yeah. And that she's sitting on a checker floor and it's kind of like a chess match. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that because when they were on the beach... They were flipped. Yeah. But now they're flipped again. I think the fact that they're flipped it, from one shot to the next is interesting because it's not just a one-time occurrence. Also, you get the checkered floor. Point is, you could maybe make that connection if you wanted to. Definitely, she's manipulating him. Oh, right? no, definitely. Because she's with the company, as we know. Um, Which, why does Charlie tell him that? Like, if Charlie's ultimate goal is is to have him succeed because if he succeeds... Maybe Charlie isn't the brightest guy. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because if because if this guy succeeds, then Charlie gets a second chance. Yeah. And this is the second time we're going to see in movies we've done a type of palm reading situation. And in both of these movies, the last one we did with this was uh, Toby Dammit, which is also very much about capitalism at this point in time. I was going to bring up Toby Dammit, honestly. Yeah. Just because when he first takes off the bandages, he kind of reminds me of the actor from that. Oh, know. Terrence Stamp? Yeah. Just yeah, the, a little just, bit. Just the, the Terrence Stamp looks really like out of it. Yeah. 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 Um, they're both people who are beat to hell and back. Yes. Um, they also both get drunk as fuck. But yeah, for anybody who hasn't seen Toby Dammit, it would make an interesting double feature with this. They're made around the same time, although Toby Dammit is more, I think, explicitly political um, and more flamboyant than this movie. And in color. Yeah. But they're also about the idea of the authenticity of of, of a capitalist-controlled experience and how they manipulate this idea of authenticity, authenticity and what's actually real or what's actually fake and how it constricts your ability to have any sort of political agency in life. But another interesting thing I want to talk about this character is the idea of introducing her on the ocean and how that connects to the idea of grasping for reality. Um, listeners may not know this, but one, I, one movie we've sort of thought about doing a little bit and we haven't done yet is The Seventh Seal. And an interesting th thing about The Seventh Seal is... It's it a hard one to do, though. Like, it's, it's been talked about to death, yeah. so it's a little bit of a challenge in that way, but we've been trying to you know just generally branch out with all the movies we do. And one of the interesting things about The Seventh Seal is that it begins with this opening sequence against the ocean, right? And it's very much like this tabula rasa image. Of course, the ocean and the shore is this interesting spot because it's this place of philosophical reflection just in terms of the imagery. You have the ocean, with, which is this image of like formlessness and infinite possibilities that can't be pinned down or possessed. And then you have what's real, the rocks, right? It's almost like a Scylla and Charybdis thing. And uh, what happens is in this situation, we get he associates Salome Jens with the ocean a lot. And later on in the movie, he says, you're beautiful. You're like the ocean. And when they meet, he, she asks a, a question of the ocean. She asks, who is Tony Wilson? And she says her answer she got was to mind her own business. And that's very much connecting to the themes of this movie and the idea that he is shouting to the ocean, sort of looking for this formless thing that will help define him. Of course, we can also connect this to the role that Salome Jens plays for him as a, uh, Some, a woman that will fix all his fucking problems. Kind of also like if we're going for the role of the company, like, cause this seems very out of it. This seems like very, this is, well, yeah. Do you want to pause this whole conversation about her to just talk about this? Oh yeah. The, this is very different. The Bakum, the Dionysian mystery, whatever you want to call it. The like, Bacchanal. Yeah. Sort of. the, yeah. That's it. It's based on the Greek, Traditions of worshiping Dionysus, the best of all the Greek gods. Like Greco-Roman, sir? Well, it got, Greco -Roman. Passed, it got passed on. I'm just saying, you got to be specific. No, I don't. Oh, you're wrong. Because Bacchus is much less interesting than Dionysus if you read the lore, because they didn't take a lot of the good stories when they co-opted the Greek culture. And oh, whatever. It was just an excuse for people to get drunk. No, it, it was, but like I love the fact that it's like a context of a religious ceremony. It's just like, yeah, we drink a lot of fucking wine and just have a lot of sex because it's the God of debauchery and pleasure. It's also just funny because this is what this old stodgy man's most out there idea is. Yeah. Is a Greek Bacchanal. <laughs> it's the most yeah. oldest idea of what 
like non-conformity yeah, is <laughs> non-conformity hedonism <laughs> oh it's the most traditional idea of it actually possible at the same time i understand why it survived all these years this looks like fun although i would never fucking drink the wine they're making oh no but like i was saying because like he gets like very angry at one point and it's just like how dare you like leave me and so it's like dude you came along for this. Like everybody's taking their clothes. He's off. just too conservative. Yeah. Like, yeah. At this point, just fucking go along with it, man. Just, yeah. You don't have to like go every week. You don't have to join their email list, but like have a good time. It's yeah. It's like a music festival. Like you go and you're just like, Oh, everybody's on Molly and <laughs> I don't this, really like any of the bands playing, this but this is just like a music festival. I might as well just have a good time and go along with the insane right. hippies that are here. Don't do that. No, I'm sorry. Do I not was, lick your lips into I, the fucking microphone. I was doing that to mimic the disgusting guy who was doing it. Speaking of disgusting. This is though, also, funnily enough, this is like, strikes me as the most, this is what a stodgy East East Coast person thinks Californians do all day. Yeah, which isn't entirely <laughs> not accurate, but. <laughs> not all day. Yeah, you have to sleep. And you have to make time to go to In-N-Out. You gotta go to In-N-Out. <laughs> it's the one requirement. Of course, the other interesting thing about this is that this is going to carry on a weird undertone in this movie of like just references to Greco-Roman culture. Um, the first one is, of course, the inscription on the tennis trophy, right? Fidelis Saturnus, even yeah. though it's kind of like pseudo Latin. Well, it can be translated. It can be translated two way. It can be internal faith or faithful forever were the two huh. translations I got for it. So I just don't know if that's actual Latin or some sort of weird bastardization of Latin. I'm not a Latin scholar. No, I think it. I think it should be spelled a turn us, not a turn is. Whatever. But Point is, it's it's still picking up that thread. And then you've also got the fact that when he his name isn't actually Tony Wilson, it's no. Antiochus, which is a very Greco-Roman name. I don't know if that's a specific figure in sort of like Greco-Roman Antio- Hellenistic history. I know Antioch is something important. I can't. God. There probably was somebody who. Well, Antioch is is. That's what, like, with the Crusades and everything, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. Point is, that's that's definitely a, a name from that time period. It may or may not be somebody who's significant, that it could be a direct reference. Um, and then also, you just have this Bacchanal, right? And I don't, I'm not quite sure what to make of all the Greek references. I don't know if there's any others. I'd be curious to see if anybody has anything to say about that. But it is interesting that it has that thread going through it, because it's clearly doing something with that stuff. Antiochus IV was a Hellenistic-era king. Of the Seculate Empire from seven, yeah, seventeen or I'm sorry, one seventy five BC until his death in one sixty four BC. And there we have the statue, which is kind of Greek Persian looking, I'd say. He uh, nearly conquered Egypt, and he was famous for persecuting Jews. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. So maybe that's the commentary is that this guy secretly hates Jewish people. <laughs> I don't know. And yes, we see him resisting the chaos and her trying to drag him into it. To be fair, I wouldn't want to get into that. No. I, just, I don't want to get next to these dirty hippie people. I just want to drink wine and relax. I mean, I, like I don't get along. Maybe smoke a nice cigar. I don't get along with to do that. I don't get along with hippies that well um, philosophically just because... I find, not to go off on a huge tangent, but I find a lot of hippies aren't nearly as like politically involved as they put out to be, and they're just really in it for the drugs and pleasure. But if I'm already there for the drugs and pleasure, sure, whatever. I'm not going to be the one wet, yeah, wet sock at the time. Just to <laughs> wet make it, sock? Yeah. <laughs> wet sock is more miserable than a wet blanket. It's a wet sock you need to have on if you're going to wear shoes. Wet blanket you can just not put on. I do love the way this is shot. Again, it goes back to the same cinema verite style that it established earlier. And it's weird because one, you would never expect the scene necessarily to be in this movie. No, it is kind of all. random, although it works perfectly, I think. Um, but also it's not necessarily the, like well, this the scene, way you would expect it to be shot either. Well, this scene, like, cause it comes is, sort of abstract, but no, cause like, this is like the way I interpret this is like, cause this is the part where he starts accepting it. Yeah. But like when he falls in there, it's like very just like, it almost looks visceral. Just like there's like 
shit flying off of him. Like, this can be seen as like a literal rebirth scene. Yeah. When he finally starts accepting it. Definitely you could read it that way where he's got all the all After the grapes birth. on him and everything. Yeah. Yes. And and just the the idea of like also that's the other thing about Dionysus is like it's not just the big party, it's also like ravenous mindlessness. Yeah. You know, people would go talk about like followers of Bacchus ripping people to shreds in like an orgiastic kind of like frenzy, sort of like piranhas yeah. right in the woods or whatever. And there's like a hidden violence to it too, uh, which is kind of unsettling too. When you think about it that yes, way, the God of revelry and it was quite a bit different than what we might think of revelry is today. Yeah. Well, it had that ambiguity where it could be something that, that was just sort of like a joyous party or just something that was sickly joyous and kind of disgusting and disturbing that was also violent. The point is that people lose control, you know? Yeah. And this is supposed to be him learning how to not have to control his life in that sort of way. And it seems to almost work, and now we're back at the beach. But this is probably a good time to pick up that thread again we were talking about, about associating her with the ocean and how that works with her as a character. We've talked a lot, I think, in other movies about how how we get annoyed when movies really buy into the idea of a male protagonist that meets a girl that changes their life yes, in a I way mean, that is like patronizing and annoying. The modern term that's brought up a lot is the manic pixie dream girl. Right. Which Although that's one version of it's it. It's one version of it, yeah. but it's like the most contemporary, like you see this a lot trope. A lot of people are becoming much more self-aware about that and yeah. are reluctant to use that's, it. That's I would say that's probably like the most high school uh sort of High schoolish, and um, I would say like "quote unquote" quirky yeah. version of of that image, but it's definitely not a new idea. No, definitely not. And it's something that I think shows up in a lot of movies around this time um, because of just I, I, you know, Freud had been in the in circulation culturally for a while now, but the idea of wh- how men relate to women and how women almost to a lot of male characters in movies act as like stepping stones from one part of their life to another. And they only exist in reference to the man, right? They are not their own person. They exist to be something that unlocks the next stage of their character arc, right? Like she says, you are Tony Wilson and within you, there is a key that is unturned, right? In a weird way, he sees her as, as the type of key that opens that lock, right? She's the secret sauce that makes his life perfect. Even though, like, we assume since she works for the company, like, she's not going to stay with him forever. She's right. She's just doing this to, like, help his transition. Well, we know it's a lie now. Yeah. Also, it's fun to bring up how uh, this movie, once again, brings back, like, the shoulder mount for the drunk cam again. Yeah, and, like, this isn't... In a way that I, I think, again, it sets that up earlier, but you don't know it's going to pay it off again in this situation, yet it works really well here. It's just as, like, ugh... Get up, stop it as the original one was, even though, like, the shoulder mount? No, j- well, just the kiss. The close ups? Yeah. Yeah. It's just as loveless as it was before. It's the same. He's living the same life. I think definitely the moment where she says, This isn't like you. Yeah. You get a little, you get, you start sniffing a little bit. You're like, That doesn't smell right with me. That I don't like that. I don't like that. I'm suspicious. But at any rate, she is, she is a representation of that idea of the woman that has to help complete the man's progression from one part of his life to the next. And uh, that's why this movie, I would say, uses a lot of like Oedipal undertones in terms of the Oedipal complex, because that's a lot of what that sort of um, psychological development is in Freud, is the idea that, you know, even in a symbolic sense, not necessarily a literal sense, men try to always usurp this idea of their father, right? And you do that by how possessing the mother right so you have to turn the woman into a possession that once you get it you then signify your progression into the status of being the father right and that means you become you enter the status of being the authority making figure and you're not regulated again right and because this is you know john frankenheimer in a number of his movies at this time is making movies about men with like weak masculinity or very fragile masculinity. I think it's very natural that in this movie they would prey off that and try to use this woman as the thing that seals the deal of this reality, right? Because they know that that is what he needs 
to actually progress into this life because he's weak, you know? Or is it? Because, okay, if we want to go back to the point you brought up much earlier on of a homoerotic reading of this movie. Okay. Where early on we get a phone call from an old friend who meant a lot to him. They played sports together. Apparently they hung out a lot. They apparently both won this trophy, but he got to keep it and they carved faithful forever on the bottom of it. And now he's freaking out because he's getting a phone call from him in the past and he's unsatisfied with his wife and he wants to see him again. That's the motivation for all of this. Yeah. And definitely if you wanted to look at the motivation for why he was freaked out yeah, about him being dead, I don't necessarily think there's a narrative implication but, there, but, but so if he wants to try again at life, if he wants to go, if he's unsatisfied and he wants another go and he ends up unsatisfied with this life as well, right? Mm-hmm. He could just be thinking like, oh, I ended up with the wrong woman. That's why I'm not satisfied in this marriage. That's why it's loveless is because I'm done with like, I, I just ended up with the wrong one. I just need to find the right woman. And then he finds this woman that like the company has like manufactured to be perfect for him and like will ease his transition into his new life perfectly. Right. And it's still not right for him. That can be read as a homoerotic thing of just like, I've tried with multiple women now and it's just like, Oh, I can't form a connection with them. I think you could read that into it. I think it's a little bit more ambiguous than the beginning part of this because mostly, Oh no, it's ambiguous and it's just, it seems to be ruined for him because well, actually they say years passed. I guess I assume they have sex, but also it's kind of like not necessarily spelled out. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that now because this woman, he, he hears her say we changed sex and he thinks it's sex. Um, which is again, just a little, a, a thing that connects to the transformation that he also, she has casually gone mentions they do virgin sacrifice. Um, yeah, I think it's supposed to be some sort of religious thing, by the way, anybody who's watching this with us, rock Hudson got g- genuinely drunk for the scene. And I think you can tell those, you can't fake those eyes, no. honestly. And you can't fake his reactions where she's saying something to him and he misses it. And he's like, Oh, Oh, now I get it. Yeah. I think it's really funny <laughs> the way he gets drunk. <laughs> Uh, it was definitely the right decision for this well, entire good sequence. Good for them for still being able to control. Like, <laughs> Drunk people are not the easiest to direct when you're trying to get them to your car or your Uber at the end of the night. Well, you Never know mind what? An Rock scene. Hudson is a professional. He is a I'm professional. sure he was committed to doing it when he got drunk. But you know what? Uh, it's funny because also, I don't know if it's this is true, but I really, really, really think that Frank Sinatra and, uh, uh, God, what's his name? Lawrence Harvey got drunk for a scene together in Manchurian Candidate 2. So maybe this is an auteur yeah. thing. Maybe John Frankenheimer is like, whenever somebody gets t- drunk in my movies, they're going to get drunk for real. I think Frank Sinatra <laughs> drunk sounds like a dangerous game, though. I feel like if anybody was going to be hard to control, it would be him. But it's actually a big bonding moment for them in that movie. Oh, that's nice. Ever, whenever, Because I love Sinatra. Because like he Sinatra's has, an asshole. I know, that's the thing. Like He has an amazing voice, but every time I find out things about him, I'm just like, oh... But if you want to know how to be nice to, to like, I'd say specifically women. Just do everything that Frank Sinatra <laughs> did. In yes. Um, but anyway, uh, oh, what, what were we talking about before this? I'm glad we got this moment in here where we forgot what we were just saying. Uh, uh, yeah, we've been drinking too. Yeah. Oh, well, also, if we're going to talk about the homoerotic undertone of this, right? Obviously, Rock Hudson is a star that people might associate with that because there's a little bit of an open secret. Right. His his closeted sexuality, as it was with a lot of Hollywood people at the time. Right. Confirmed Um, bachelors, as they were called during the times. Or they they just had beards. Right. They were they had to do marriages specifically for their image, which is very much a sort of uh, composed image, much in the same way that they do in this movie. Right. And um, it was a relatively common occurrence. Um, Obviously, it didn't happen to everybody. But there are plenty of people in old Hollywood that were closeted or sort of closeted that had to sort of regulate their life in this very specific way. And I think that might be part of what adds to the strength of Rock Hudson's performance here because this is not necessarily super different from what he would be doing anyway. And that's on top of the fact that Rock Hudson, that's not his real name. That's a stage name. Well, yeah. There are, there are a lot of names. Where you're just I like, don't know if stage names are less common now. But it was definitely a big thing in the past that you had to come up with a name that worked I mean, for you. A, you know? a lot of actors change their names, even if it's just slightly to make it like cooler. 
like Tom Cruise. That was his middle name that he right. made his last name because. Well, also there's things with like, you know, different guild memberships, I think, where uh, I think definitely for the director's guild that you can't necessarily take the name of somebody who's already been been in the guild. Yeah. So sometimes sense. people add middle initials for no reason. Right. So it's, it's, it might have to do with that too, but it's business related. You know, it's driven by finance, by capitalism and it creates an identity for you that you then have to inhabit. And we now have this guy who has been the customer in the center of all this attention. He's acting against the interests of the company. So he yeah. literally gets carried off. And it's just interesting that you have those real life, connections here with rock hudson you know um i don't think it just gives to the strength of performance but i think it adds like this weird quality to the movie and even this whole bit right where they're carrying him off is this not reminiscent of a very old hollywood thing where back in the day there were a lot of bad people in hollywood um people would get some sort of star power and they would use it to get what they want. They'd abuse other people one way or another, right? Yeah. And part of the the thing with that was that in the old days, stars used to be under contract at studios. So they were part of your image. They were your employees. But also that was part of the like, they got to get out of jail free card with all sorts of shit because people would just come in and they'd be like cleaners. They would clean situations for these people, right? And what would happen is you get a lot of stars who would do crazy things like this and, you know, you would then have to get people who would come in and pick up the pieces of it, right? And try to keep them on a leash if possible. And it kind of reminds me of that as well. And here, once again, we go back to the 9.7 millimeter lens. And I think that's a big part of what impresses me about this movie too, is just if we're going to talk about James Wong Howe and the genius of this cinematography, is with the lenses and different types of shots, he's able to in the first 15 to 20 minutes, use all the lenses you're going to see throughout the movie. And which, I mean, most movies don't use a ton of lenses, but the, these are very conspicuous choices here, right? Yeah. So he makes those decisions in the first 20 minutes of the movie or so. Um, and he shows you different types of shot setups that he's going to repeat and reuse throughout the rest of the movie. And every time he goes back to a specific type of Verite handheld camera or every time he goes back to the shoulder mount or every time he goes back to the 9.7 millimeter lens, it sort of adds a new layer to what was going on the first time you saw it. I wonder, sorry, this is a side bit I just saw. Yes. Yeah. Like of her like reaction because she works for the company. Right. Do you think that one is the service open to women? And two, oh, interesting question. Is that their role instead of sitting in the room trying to get new clients? Is their role to try to help male clients transition? Oh, I didn't even think of that. It's just like it's not a question the movie's interested in answering or will we'll ever have a No, relate. I think I think that is important. This movie is about gender. Yeah. It is significant that all the people in that room are men. Yes. And I think it also says something about the way the system you know what? I'm going to say that retcon could work where if there are women in the system, they're segregated from the men and they play yeah. a different role in serving the men, but that potentially that could still be it. Yeah. The thing is this, this movie highlights something that is interesting. Like we've been saying with how it preys on his weak masculinity, the great thing about this movie in having everyone be men is that it sets up that identity for you as a customer. You know what I mean? It wants you to want to be a traditional man. Because it needs that to survive. It needs you to be that so it can market it to you and it can prey on your insecurities and your failure to embody that image of a man. That they've created. Yes. They and need you to feel that sense of lack, right? Because then they will sell you something to fill that sense of lack. This is the way it works. They create an image, right? They create a need and then sell you the solution to yes. the need they've created. Yes. All the time. They create the lack, is a, a term that a lot of people use. Um, they create the lack that you feel, and then they they create the arbitrary solution for something you don't need. That's the way it works. And uh, it didn't occur to me that that there may not, might not be women in this. It did occur to me that definitely they were targeting men. Yeah. But it's interesting to think of a whole other side of this movie where it's the women's facility, you know? Yeah. And that they separate it in that different way and that they need 
men and women to have these very strict regulated identities so they can control them and manipulate them, right? Yeah, that's an interesting point. For some reason, the way the light falls on that screen door is very beautiful to me. James Wong Howe is just such an amazing cinematographer. He's done work on a ton of different movies throughout the classical Hollywood era. And I think a lot of his movies, even in the studio era, just look ahead of their time. Well, no, like in lighting, it's kind of, it's slightly harder to appreciate in black and white films unless it's very harsh for a lot of it. But like just the gentle lighting in this house is done so, so well. Like It's interesting how uh, the lighting, I mean, it's all cinematography, right? But yeah. they they do such a great job of changing the tone of everything, right? Yeah, because this place was dark and miserable when he was inhabiting it before, but now yeah. it's just like sort of like this calm, just like return to like, oh, this is this is nice. This is It's what... not necessarily perfect. No. But it's not, and it's not necessarily like everything he wants, but it's an idea of stability. Yeah, and like he's... Looking you know, at this, it's just like, I, it wasn't as bad as I remember it being. Yeah, it's interesting that we introduce it to this whole drawing room area with the slow lockdown shot that's panning. In a movie filled with so many handheld moments, we get this long lockdown shot that just follows him as he moves throughout the room, you know? Uh, it's really interesting. And then we get his wife. And, and even just everybody's appearance looks so different here you know not that rock hudson was in the earlier scenes yes but they make everybody look so much more i don't know just normal more what you'd expect from a movie but he goes here trying to like find that like oh maybe my past life was better it's like no it was also empty and loveless and a shell I think it's interesting. You can't to, romanticize the past. It's not any better than the present is. Yeah, because this is the same thing that, that he did that got him into this situation. Yeah. Right? Part of part of the selling of him being younger and part of the idea of maybe looking at this in reference to time travel stuff is the idea of nostalgia for something that didn't exist, right? Which is something that capitalism sells you constantly. <laughs> yeah. And his, and his wife just delivers the hard truth to him. It's like, oh, he's been dead. He was dead for years before the fire. And I, I think this is also the point where he learns that, again, it's interesting that he needs a woman to articulate everything for him, right? But this is, I think, truly the, the, the reason where he learns the problem, this scene. This is yes. where he learns it. Because essentially the, what he realizes is that his being a stranger to his wife now is not necessarily different from how he was a stranger to her in the past. Right. And that this is this is who he has been. And that part of the problem is that he's felt like his entire life has been regulated, you know, um, and that he he was led into a life that was was not something that he dreamt up for himself, but it was engineered by people. Right. By the system in which he lives and breathes. And again, another interesting thing about this weak masculine character and the idea of how women work in this. And we talked about it with uh, the manic pixie dream girl is that it's also, if we're, we, you can connect it to an edible com complex because it's also a vaguely mother figure. Yeah. It's right. It's like, that's like, that's the, that's one of the main things is just like, guys, some magic woman isn't going to come and fix your life. W women are people. They have their own problems. They don't right. have time to like solve all of your problems. It's like the idea that a woman exists to meet all your ends. Yeah. The idea of what a mother is, is that she loves you unconditionally, regardless of anything. And she will do everything to make you happy. Yes. But that's not what a romantic partner is. That's <sighs> right. But that the weak masculine identity still desires well, that. Well, yeah. One movie that, really early on in our podcast planning I was lobbying to do until I rewatched it with uh, my cousin was uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Cause right. I have fond memories of that movie. I rewatched it. I don't think it's the most gross use of the manic pixie dream girl trope because Ramona is developed herself as her own character and has her own goals that she's working toward. Yep. But I did find myself at the end of rewatching that movie screaming at the screen. No Ramona, you can do better. You don't need to settle for him, but I guess that's the, I'm not like a huge, I don't really like that movie, but I, I feel like it would have been okay if at the very least 
they didn't end up together. Yeah, if it did sort of end, it's just like, hey, you were the nicest guy I ever dated, and him saying, well, that's kind of sad, and he's like, yeah, and just sort of ended there. But, like, that would be melancholy, but, like... Scott yeah. should have just apologized to everybody and then yeah. left. <laughs> kind of, yes. Yeah. That's what he should have done. Well, I don't... Michael Sarah is not likable in a lot of movies. I think that's part of why he gets cast in a lot of He's things. almost too good in it, yeah. is the thing. But it is interesting when you look at the idea of how that's also a mothering figure that this weak masculine identity needs and how now that he's a younger man, it's also like he's getting that from his first wife, you yeah. know? And it highlights what he needed from Salome Jens earlier. Is you it know? just me or is it might just be this transfer, but like the film grain is drumming up dramatically in this one scene. I don't know what it is, but well, they the the film is generally grainy. Yeah, but I don't know what stock they shot it on. I like the grain of it. I do. I'm just saying, like in w- this one scene, it's super noticeable. But I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. More so than the rest of the movie. I mean, I guess if you're focusing on certain things, I'm just like, maybe it's just because it's so white. It's like, I don't know. This scene is definitely brighter than the rest. Yeah. And sure, I think you might, you might notice, you know, grain popping up on a film if more so if it's on like gray tone, right? Yeah. And again, this is so far probably the most balanced image in this movie in terms of lighting. It's pretty even compared to the rest of it. Although I will say those scenes in the uh, in the facility are a little are pretty studio esque. Although it's done in a kind of strange way, they get a little bit well, it's done m- in more in your face with the lens in those scenes. But also the studio thing, like it kind of helps to have it like almost classic Hollywood studio style, right. because it's supposed to feel very artificial and yeah. yeah. Or this like this scene, like it almost feels almost like a lot of this movie has felt like a dream sequence, but this sort of just feels like you're just kind of lightheaded and floated along. Cause like, you don't know how to react to any of this. Even this shit just in the yard. It's like, God, how do you make stuff this beautiful? And this, this, this is heartbreaking though. Like the, Oh, well I can't give you a watercolor, but do you want a memento? And it's like, he's just some random guy who showed up and this trophy like meant everything to him. And his wife was just willing to give it away to some stranger. Who well, it's interesting that him. it's, it's also the ironic thing. It's yeah. the thing that led him down this path, but now it's the only thing he has to remember is this choice in a weird way. When he says, when the guy earlier says, uh, if I may be so bold, your choice of death is is the most important choice you'll make in your life. That's yeah. like a selling point, right? That he doesn't quite deliver with enough panache. However, in a weird way, it winds up being true because ultimately, I think with this character, the ultimate decision in his life he's defined by is, de- is this decision. You know what I mean? Because only somebody this lost would do this. Yeah. And uh, part of his thing is that he's felt like he's never made any decisions. So really the only thing he's ever done in his life is this. It's very sad. (laughs) That's why this movie is miserable because you have good actors just playing out a very morbid premise. And he's, he gives delivers the big thing. He's just like, well, I want to try again. Let me go back to the company. And And I feel like that's not the thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I would say just go to California and hey, you got away from them once. Cause then you have to do the conditioning again. Yeah. God forbid. And you all already look like rock Hudson. Yeah. And the scars on your face, like just heal. Do you want to go through that again? Yeah. And here's where we start to really, I think bring the tension back up. Right. Um, and I think tail end of the movie, but, Yeah, because you get this character drama that really, for the middle part of the movie, gets at the flaws of of what he is and why this is not working for him. And now we're going to get back into the plot, right? And uh, I think this is really the part where you feel like the the jaws are closing in on him, even though that might have been an illusion and this was always going to happen. Well, like, we knew he wasn't going to get it for free because, like, the first time he paid basically with, like, his life insurance and his will, like, well, his assets were given to enough to his wife and children so that it wouldn't be suspicious. Yeah. They say there's like a thing they take care of them. Yes. So like, that's how it's paid for the first time. So the second time he goes back, you're wondering like, wait, what does he have to give them this time? Right. It's just himself. And that's the ultimate interesting thing about it that 
that makes it a real like stark statement of capitalism is that it gets to that idea that we've mentioned of reification, which in, you know, parts of Marxist criticism of different things will, it's basically the idea of when the actual consumer becomes the product. Yes. Which is very much the case right now. Cause yeah. he's being, he doesn't know, but he's being measured to, to for, be the cadaver. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, it's interesting because it's not black and white in this situation. The moment, you know, he's being measured, you know, that's what's going to happen. And yet this is before he's refused to give over any sort of names. Right. Yeah. Which makes me wonder, is that what's going to happen to Charlie? Yeah. That's what happens. In, he's not getting a new, Oh. No, he's he's getting turned into somebody else. Somebody else gets to be the Jaws mayor or whatever. <laughs> you get to be a mayor of a small town in Maine. Oh, great. I can't wait. There's no sharks there whatsoever. It is funny. It would be really amusing uh, to just in your own head have a canon for every movie he's in. And <laughs> it's just a new life he's living. <laughs> or it's just, yeah, like he keeps fucking up. <laughs> And then because he's an actor, you're like, he's performing. See, it's the character. It's not the actor. The real interesting thing is how does he recognize him? Maybe he Did he see that he was Rock Hudson? Just his mannerisms, maybe? I, well, I don't know. I assume that he has some sort of outside knowledge because the guy giving him pills makes eye contact with him. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, Maybe he doesn't recognize him, but the guy who gives him pills is like, well, I told you he was going to be coming in, it's him. They have the little TV monitors in front of them, and like early on in the movie when he's just like, oh, walk walk over the trophy, I know it's the, I know the phone will reach. So like maybe they're watching them, maybe they know what they look like. Surveillance capitalism. Yeah. Oh, very sneaky. Like, yeah, well, we're in that now. I can say one thing next to my phone and then five <laughs> seconds later I'll be getting an advertisement for it. So we're going to get advertisements for our own fucking podcast that we didn't pay for. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I hate is just like when I've already like bought a product or it's just like I've seen a movie already, but because I've like Googled it or mentioned it, like my phone won't stop showing me advertisements for it. I'm like, I've, I've already given it money. What do you want? <laughs> Leave me alone. More money. You know what the real weird thing about this entire room is? Some of these men are not like Rock Hudson. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Maybe they've just been waiting there that long. <laughs> they've been waiting. The th they looked like Rock Hudson when they all arrived. Yeah. But then as they get older again, oh boy, they stop looking like Rock Hudson and start looking like Stan Lee. This was Stan Lee's first uh, cameo in a movie. Yeah, that's him with the glasses in the right. See yeah. him? They ask him, the old southern devil man asks him what he wants to be, and he's just like, I, I want to be, be Spider-Man. I want to be a superhero. Can't do that. <laughs> Can't. We're not there yet. I've always wanted to draw comic books, too. Okay, well, we'll try to have you do that. Oh, rest in peace, Stanley. Aw. What? It's just kind of sad. I like I should have noticed yesterday, but like it didn't like it never hit me that it's like, oh, he's walking into the meat grinder when he walks out of this room. Yeah. And he kind of knows it. And no, I don't think he knows it. Well, he's like cr like because he's like crying and sort of. Well, it's been like, a year. I think he's like ready. I think he's happy as he can be. That's why he's crying. I don't know. Just look at his facial expressions. We'll see. No, he buys that he's going to get a new surgery. Because this movie wouldn't, is not about giving characters that moment. Because that would be dishonest. Well, I, I, I think here, like, he realized that, like, his second life was pointless, too. So I think it would make sense if it was just, like, no, no matter how many chances you get, it doesn't. Well, either way, yeah. Because, like, he could be crying and, like, sort of grimacing because, like, He's saying like, oh, Charlie, you're, I'm sure you'll make it this time. But he's just sort of like, eh, there's a good chance I won't. And I might. Well, I think it's here. more here when he hears that he failed. He's yeah. like, I thought you had a better chance than me. But also like. I, th I think nothing. The, the idea that there's another one is the only thing that's keeping these guys going. Right. Yeah. So I think there's nothing that that's an unimpeachable idea for these people. And once he's accepted, I think he, it's a genuine response. 
But the interesting thing is he starts crying before this guy walks in because he failed. Yes. That's why I think it's genuine. He's happy. He's like, finally, I get my opportunity. See, he's thankful. The movie knows what's up yeah. because it cuts to this guy that interrupts his emotional moment, but he is not aware. He thinks he's going to get his new body. And then Woody Harrelson is just like, what are you doing? But it is interesting when you compare this to the meatpacking stuff because this is definitely arranged formally in a similar way where you have like the rows of people in these desks, right? Yeah. And, and they, they are really just like meat sacks. And once again, they're, they're used cows. Yeah, they're back. He's back in the same blue collar type uniform. They're all wearing the same uniform in that yeah. room, right? No ties. Yeah. And uh, unbuttoned shirt. You know, that's, I think that's indicative of their status again now, where they are now being reasserted as quote unquote employees or product for the company, right? The real thing is that that was their status the entire time. It's the way they were the entire time. God, I can't stop thinking about what you said with the way women might work in the system because they call them reborns, right? But yeah. a lot of it has, a lot of what goes on in this movie is like not involving the direct presence of a woman in that process, right? Except very much so it seems like women are like the vessel that delivers this process. If you take Salome Jen's character to be yeah. indicative of it. Also the fact that Charles knows who that is and comments on it, that could just be something off the top of his head that he wasn't supposed to say, but he did. Yeah. Also implying that she does that with everybody. You know what I mean? It could be. And that's also backed up by the guy, like the fact that like one of the other reborns, like kind of pulls her aside of the party and is talking to her off in the distance for a bit. Yes. Because they're, they all participate in that yeah. progression and some of them succeed, but others don't. And, uh, it's interesting the idea that the company actually uses women as like the delivering process psychologically, you know, and that that's the role they play. Only these men aren't able to know that ever because of their fragile masculinity. And here we have the reappearance of Will Gear, who's going to ask him if he achieved his dreams. And he sort of says, I don't know. I don't even know if I ever had any dreams. Something about this guy is so sinister yeah it's like comforting and unsettling at the same time it's like uh it's because he's occupying the role of an archetype right and he's a good actor but visually the way he's lit and everything is disturbing yes um and the way it cuts back and forth is like he smiles and everything but it never makes you feel good it always it makes you upset he's too paternalistic too self-consciously paternalistic to be a good person. Another great thing you get from a lot of the long takes earlier in their interactions with one another is just the fact of getting to watch these actors express different emotions as they talk. And if you look at Will Gear's face, he's very, uh, God, he's very expressive of, of like a hidden resentment or maybe not resentment. He just, he loathes these people is the real thing. And I think you can tell because he gets this weird half like scowl on his face when when our lead is talking about his troubles at the beginning yeah and it's every time the lead is looking away he he his face just like settles and it's like sediment settling at the bottom of a lake and it's just like it's just hanging there and he's like oh god this guy hates this person and uh well because he views him as like a customer and like he doesn't care about this but the second he turns back it's like talking to a cow yeah right it's like oh, i have to do this to get the profit but okay and he's, I think he's also slightly annoyed that he has to keep doing this because, like, he's very aware right now that he's not going to live to see. Yeah. It is interesting. What is the point of doing this, you know? Money. Unless it's, unless it's to pass off. They could easily just sneak up on him while he's sleeping. Yeah. Knock him out. But, like, unless it's just, it's also part of a psychological thing for him to keep going. Right. Yeah. Because he says that he was part of this small business. I think he says in the conversation right now, he started this business by himself. He's the founder of this business. And it was sort of taken over by a board of people at some point. 
Yeah, he yeah he said like when the people started coming back and failing their yeah being reborn, their second life. Um, it was heartbroken. He wanted to shut it all down, but the board of directors and all the money they were making at that point just right. wouldn't allow it. So it's also potentially part of a psychological thing for him as well. You know, uh, whatever he needs to do to keep being in that control and in the air of the mission. That's what he says the entire time. He's like, you know, the mistakes were not wasted. Don't you worry. Right. Um, and part of it is like, he'll give these people the pretense of like a pat, a nice send off. Right. Uh, and then he'll like spin it maybe in his own mind as he's, he, you know, they're repurposing these people. They're recycling Max. Yeah. This is clean body recycling is what it is. So he can, it's, he's washing. So somebody's other, else's dream he's washing can his, win yeah, yeah he's washing his hands of the blood he's because this is going to go to someone else's dream oh yeah. this is such an amazing shot but it, it, it's interesting he says that and he says that they have a really high failure rate yeah right it's like 70 percent or something yes like that. it's crazy but uh, damn this shot is amazing yeah and this guy going on and on about being protestant is best even though he's cynically trained to be a rabbi Oh, I just love how minister. fucking casually cynical and evil it is. Something about this really reminds me of the Nazis. The systemicness of how this guy is going to be just executed. The, the, yeah, the, the clean medical way this person is going to be executed and, is going to be reminiscent of the concentration camps and just sort of like the cold record-keeping way of killing people. Like, yeah, and just, I think specifically it's the the, like... It is the other, utterly like superfluous and perfunctory presence of the spiritual person. You know what I mean? It's as perfunctory as possible just to keep the pretense of everybody's hands being clean. You know what I mean? It's like, no, this is evil. This is evil. Um, and if ever there was one shot that really embodied why this movie was a financial failure at the time, I think it's probably the shot of Rock Hudson screaming and writhing in terror. Yeah. Which goes on for, I think, 30 seconds. <laughs> what doesn't, like, I don't know. I it's think you pretty were, amazing. I think you as a viewer know that, like, as soon as he's getting strapped into the cart. Yeah, after, you're just like, oh, Christ. And he's, he's not coming back. But the interesting thing is, I think the way they use this wide-angle lens, which Jacob's Ladder stole, totally. Um, but it's amazing visually. And then just the fact of them putting Rock Hudson in this situation... Even at this point, the first time I watched this movie, I wasn't even truly aware of who Rock Hudson was, but I, was I knew he was say, a star. You, you seem to have a rock hard on for. Oh, rock do you want Hudson. to try that again? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Saying it out loud makes it seem not even worth it. Keep going. Oh man, he is a good actor, but I, I think you know that he's going to be in trouble. But the fact that they actually follow it up with this visual punch of him screaming and squirming in in this like while he's tied down is just. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Just the fact that they decide to do that. I think it's the bullet point that this movie ends on without him doing that. Can you imagine if he was just strapped down and he couldn't move the visual of him getting that thing stuffed in his mouth, the cotton, right. And then just being strapped down and struggling against it is I think, I think it's a big part of this movie's success because we've followed this character this entire time. And then finally at the end, we're just going to see him try as hard as he can to escape and then fail. You know, that is so morally defeating for an audience. You're literally seeing him. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing he can do. And we still have two minutes of movie left where we yeah. get to watch him die. Oh, God. And it's so unsettling because it's like heavily implied. He's still completely conscious throughout all of it. So like at least at the beginning part of it, they start before it's completely over. Yeah. They're even putting his finger in tubes. Well, yeah, they have to erase his uh, fingerprints. They have to destroy. I'm assuming that's acid. Oh, I don't know. Well, because it's connected. You see, uh, like the five tubes coming down from the IV right up there. You have to, and they said before Maybe. they have to completely erase all the fingerprints. Yeah, while keeping the hands intact. So, of course, he says, "You were my best work." Yeah, because he's not a customer; he's a commodity. Yeah, that's the that's the whole that's the real point. Yes. Yeah, and that's the end. Ultimately, that's the that's like the logical conclusion of like unrestrained capitalist systems. And particularly American capitalism is that that's what happens. Because when everything is for sale, even your consumers are for sale. So, I don't know. Very depressing movie. Yeah, this movie does not end on a 
It doesn't leave you with any good feelings throughout all of it, but it definitely doesn't end on a higher note than any of the rest of the movie. <laughs> it's interesting because we're going to see some stuff coming up here um, with the final shot, which I think is very poetic and beautiful. Um, and, oh, God, this shot, too, with the drill. Ugh. It's incredible because... Oh, the noises that it makes, though. Yeah, yeah, where you hear it, like, pause for a second and then break through his skull. Yeah. Oh, God. But, yeah, here really beautiful final shot. I think this is as good of a final shot I've ever seen in movies, just because this is such a poetic way to show the final things going on in someone's mind as they die. Yeah. And again, it pays off the very beginning of the movie. It's just so clever. I love that final shot, oh, but it, yeah. it is sort of something connected to scenes that I think were cut from the movie with his daughter. I think you can sort of piece together. That's his daughter. Um, if you think about it, but there were originally some scenes, I think where at least, I think, I don't know to what extent he talks to her and interacts with her, but there was a little bit more of that, that gets cut as it is. The movie is still pretty fantastic. Um, if you watch, I don't know how many of our listeners watch the movie while we do this, or if they've seen the movies and then listen to it, but I can definitely say that this episode may be more than a number of our other episodes is about a movie that if you have not seen it, or if you just have no interest in watching it, you're missing so much. We say that about a lot of the movies you suggest, though. Um, but I feel like this one hits you on such a gut yeah. level that we can say that it's tense or miserable, but there's really no replacement for watching it because you can't really get an idea of the specific way it does that. It's so specifically made. There's really, in terms of the aesthetics, everything just came together for this movie. And I can't think of a lot of movies where they fit so perfectly together. Does, this is a masterpiece for me. It does work very well. And it's just, I said, it's like a Twilight Zone, but like, I like the Twilight Zone. I don't think any episodes have had like this guttural of effect on me. Yeah. It makes you feel it has a really palpable effect. And that's what I mean when it's a, when I say it sort of pioneers an aesthetic of paranoia because it genuinely does it. And it's just well-conceived. It's a well-conceived idea. They really do a good job fleshing out how this business works while also only giving you the right amount of information. Yeah. So this has been Seconds. Which, uh, honestly, I would recommend, if you have seen before, for a second viewing, because oh. as I found out, there are tons of fun things that you can catch in the movie that you're just like, oh, they set this up perfectly. Yeah, it is really fun, right? Yeah. They do a good job with the details, but yeah. If you'd like Seconds of the Spectator Film Podcast... Hey, I knew you couldn't resist the entire uh, time. <laughs> You can check out our web sp website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We have uh, episodes on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. And we have social media stuff, specifically Letterboxd, which is the coolest social media. Max, do you have anything else to say? Um, no, I'm not even going to try to think of a dumb thing to say because All right. I won't get a second chance at it. <laughs> All right, bye. Stay tuned for more bad jokes, everyone. <laughs>